<laughs> nice. Okay. Uh, well, Danny, thanks for, for the intro. Happy to, to be here with you all. And uh, this has been an, uh, an awesome experience and to share with you all like this work. I really have enjoyed it and hope to connect you with you all next year in an in-person event for sure. So uh, <laughs> for today's talk, <laughs> for today's talk, uh, I'm going to be sharing a little bit more about like traditional versus agile hardware development and how we can, let's say, change a little bit the way of how we are validating our ideas to be able to move forward in a more quickly and we can say easy way. Uh, but before I start, I am going to introduce myself. I am Maria Hernandez, as just Daniel shared. I am part of the Rag Wallace team and currently working as a developer relations lead in uh, the team. And for those who don't know about Rag Wallace, uh, Rag Wallace is a hardware IoT provider company that provides end to end solutions to deploy IoT solutions. Uh, for using different kind of technologies, uh, but our main focus is uh, power solutions over LoRa and LoRa One technologies. However, we are not limited to BLE, Wi-Fi, cellular, narrowby, and OT, and among others. So that is all about the introduction. So let's get started with the presentation. Um, so basically, what you have over here. Uh, there are like some ready to, to use devices, ready to deploy devices uh, that you can simply use it to toggle like one specific use cases. However, to be able to, to have these in your hands, uh, you have to spend a lot of months and also like resources from different engineers teams in order to be able to have these products in, in a viable way, right? So for example, we have in the first option, we have a NAS tracking device. That is a pretty small device that can be used uh, for multiple purposes, either for tracking a pet or tracking your car, your scooter, or a truck, anything you need, you can just place it and you're ready to go. Then we have uh, just a feedback system. that is a, a button device, like some four buttons device that can help you to generate some feedback system application just to, for example, garner customer uh, scale, customer satisfaction scales, or if you want to just control some blinds remotely or any other assets remotely, you can easily do it to it, or some environmental sensors um, to be deployed on different environments. However, like if you want to build some of these, as I just shared, you have to spend like a couple of months as well as many efforts in order to be able to have it as you are expecting. And also like having a full entire experience for an end client. So basically what we're going to do here is starting an IoT project. So basically in three, two, one, let's go. <laughs> Uh, this is like the first thing that you can imagine. Like maybe, so, 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 uh, maybe like most of you and are then, familiar with then. this, <laughs> for sure. Exactly. Like uh, when we start with an idea, maybe because a client or a friends told us, "Hey, um, I have this idea, and I think IoT can help us to gather more relevant data about this and be able, and uh, will it's going to help us to make some." like more smarter decisions, or it's going to help us to save some money. So basically what you, the first thing that you do is uh, the requirements gathering. You're going to listen the needs of the solution that you're trying to achieve. And then you go to your lab uh, for all of those who are passionate makers or IoT enthusiasts as well as engineers and system integrators. They have a bunch of things on their houses, on their labs. In my, case, my lab is my house. <laughs> uh, so uh, you go to your lab and you take your breadboard, you take the, the most relevant uh, device uh, that that it can meet the, the requirements that you are gathering, as well as some additional sensors or actuators or either communication models based on the requirements that you are gathering. If you need a uh, long range communication, maybe I should use a LoRa one model, for example, and so on. So basically, this is like the initial stage, and this is like the common way to achieve a nearly stage of what is called a proof of concept. Uh, this can be like, this cannot be like showing to a client because they are going to get us scared about this big Frankenstein, but basically you can use it to prove and validate the idea they are presenting to you. And in this way, this customer can be happy and will give you some suggestions to then move forward to the prototyping stage where you're going to develop like a custom PCB for, 
for all of this. So when you jump to that prototype in a stage, uh, normally we use uh, some pre-existing models, either for like MCUs or communication models or either existing sensors, uh, in order to interconnect all of them on a custom board that meets also the requirements that we are gathering. Uh, normally, the best way to go is using like, for example, if we're going to use some radio models, they are like some quite difficult to, to design itself. So it's best, it's best to leave this to the experts and just like simply use prefabricated models and just put it in our board and integrate it and make our own design. So basically what we are going to do here is the same thing that we do in the previous stage is repeating the testing of the proof of concept but, but this time is in a more scalable version. Let's say with this, this is a custom design, you can make more than 10. You can make up to 10, 100 devices or even more. Since it's, since it's something that is fully customized to the need that you are presenting. So in this way, you can send it to the customer and has a more presentable form factor for presented to them. And we can say that it will be on its way of being almost ready to go to, to a product, like a final product. And once this device is deployed, it will go into that evaluation phase, right? We need to test it on the field, evaluate if the model is working right, uh, if the sensors that we choose are the most appropriate ones, and so on. So after going through the proof of concept, then going to the, to the prototyping stage and do, going to the evaluation stage, and we, we want to finally go to a commercial product production, we can spend uh, at least like six to nine months, depends on the efforts that you are putting on this solution and this project. However, if we change this way, maybe that time can be completely reduced and the time to market can be much faster as it is normally in a traditional development hardware Main. When what we have over here is just a waterfall form a structure, or of how it is the traditional hardware development. First, we got we got the other requirements. Then we design something based on the requirements that we gather. Then we implement all of these. Then we verify everything it's meeting those requirements, and then we need to deploy it and maintain it over the time. But when you get to the, that final stage of the device, you usually don't go back. But because like that means that you have to resign your device like entirely and then change completely everything that you have been working during the past month. So it's quite difficult to change devices or even technologies on your devices when this device is already deployed on the field. So it's like, we can say that, which is a, a, like a, a, a big problem is we often find these big problems or concerns of our solution when we are on the final stages. So let's just put as an example, an agriculture, uh, an example in the agriculture sector. Let's say that the development, the development was initially uh, defined to use Sigfox or let's say Narvan IoT as a, as a connectivity type for the solution based on the environment. But then after the results of the of the testing phase were obtained, uh, we realized that the best option for it was not Sigfox or Narrowban, but it was LoRa. That means that you have to change absolutely everything, go backwards, which is a big problem and also will be uh, like, a, we, we get a, like a high cost for, for the team and for all the investment you have been putting in that product itself. So in some way, we should change the way of how we are developing these and look for a more agile way well to do it since we can change models on the go. Let's say that after I identify that the best option was not Sigfox or Narrowband, I can just go through, go to my device, take a block, inter, interconnect, uh, uh, remove the block that I was using, put another one on top of that, and you're ready to go. You migrate your technology with just one clip. So this is why Rag Wallace designed the whistle. This device was designed and considering all the problems that the individuals were facing in the development of Internet of Things products, and specifically in the hardware sector. Uh, that, that's Rack, that is why Rack Wallace uh, decided to invest in this open source project. I'm going to highlight this open source project 
that is completely changing the way of how we are develop how we are going through those development phases when we are going to validate an idea of yeah. any project for any kind of industry. We look, it's right there to help get it started with IoT in a much easier way than before. And also not just on the hardware side, but also on the software side, since we provide the right tools and documentations to help you to go through that process in the most smooth way. Uh, as a development environment, you can take the advantage of the easy to use Arduino IDE framework, which is a compilation of open source processing sensors and communication libraries. And for those models that doesn't have a pre-existing open source library, the Red Wireless team uh, have a Wislog repository on their GitHub repo, in their GitHub repo uh, and provides a solution completely for it. Also for those let me, let me interrupt real quick. It, it sounds like someone might have their mic on in the audience and be doing um, like having another conversation. So if you could, could you mute yourself? Um, I'm curious until the audio comes yeah, through. Just, Perfect, right. thanks. Sorry, Maria, back to you. No, not a problem at all. So also for those who are looking to, I don't know, have a, a more um, advanced idea for complex applications or configurations or debugging, they can also use platform IO for that. And MicroPython support is on the way. So this is what you can see over here is the Wislog ecosystem, the newest standard for modular IoT that no matter the industry, we'll, Wislog will adapt it seamlessly to it since the limit on processing, connectivity, sensor, actuator, or anything are entirely up to you. Because if you remember, I just say there's an open source project, either on hardware or software. And this ecosystem already have more than 50 models available to meet different kinds of uh, application, either using Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, cellular, narrowband IoT, or LoRa, and with different kind of sensors for monitoring application, uh, weather monitoring application, uh, GPS tracking, industrial environment using 4 to 20 million first, uh, deep sensors, or 0 to 5 volts, uh, control motors uh, in big factories. Like, we, Rack Wallace team is thinking of, okay, what is the market using right now for developing their sensors? So basically what we do is taking those industrial and robust sensors, convert them into these small, small and tiny blocks, and then give you a piece that is right there to help you to just interconnect as, is, as if you were playing with Lego, to be able to develop a solid proof of concept in a quickly way, and also in an industrial grade format. So this is the Wislog itself, uh, as I just shared. The Wislog has different kind of models on their ecosystem. We have the baseboard, which basically is the socket that connects all the Wislog models, and also have like all the power supply for the Wislog core, the Wislog sensors, and also the other Wislog IO models. And also have, and also this board, this baseboard serve you to mount <laughs> these base, these like. Um, PCB on any enclosure since it has the specific holes to mount it as it should. And then we have the core. The core itself is the data processing center of the WISLOG and it also has the embedded communication at, within the core. And we provide some different different type of cores among them uh, ones to provide BLE and um, um, LoRa, others that provide just the LoRa, others that provide just uh, Wi-Fi and that's mm -hmm. That is going to depend entirely on the solution that you are trying to achieve because you can just interchange the different core. And also, if you want to have some backup connectivity, you also have the IO slot module that allows you to expand the connectivity capabilities. Let's say I have a, a solution with the Nordic and, and, and with the Nordic core. The Nordic, the Nordic core MCUs have BLE embedded, and then the RAC core push forward to the LoRa center to the center chip for the direct communication. And then on the IO model, you can just place an IO cellular model. So you are going to have in the same device, the three connectivity options. So you can have other connectivity as a backup. So it's it's pretty cool. And then the part the sensors, we have a bunch of sensors right there. And also the IO models is um, that space that is that allows you to add additional inputs and outputs, as well as communication capabilities uh, for your IoT projects. So it's time to 
of the workshop time, workshop time, as we say over here, based on, on time, <laughs> based on, on, on the time that we have available, it's going to be like a hand-on session workshop time, as right. I will I will love to have it. However, I'm going to show you the step-by-step -step that you need to follow in order to achieve a great integration in just a couple of things. So basically, the requirements that you have for this workshop, it's a pretty simple, you need a Wizblog a Wizblog baseboard um, that you can openly find it on the um, on the Wizblog on the Brad Wallace store. Uh, I just placed like three three models over here, which is the baseboard, the LP1 model, as well as an environmental sensor that is based on the Bosch sensor, which is a well known on the IoT community. This sensor allows you to gather the data of temperature, humidity, by pressure, and gas resistance. Uh, however, you can use any of the sensors that I, I have been just sharing with you all. Then we need to use a LoRaWAN coverage. We need to have LoRaWAN coverage available since we are using an LP1 core model. I would want to transmit data in long, in terms of long range communication. And for this, we can use either the ThingStack, Helium, or the other LoRaWAN network servers that we have available right there. I wanted to bring Helium into this conversation since it is a technology that has been there during the past two years at least, and it has like a really big value for those IoT entrepreneurs, IoT enthusiasts that are looking to test and, and test and validate an idea over LoRaWAN technology, but they don't have like enough budget, for example, to get a $500 uh, gateway to handle this test because that was the, the the main concern that we have in the past. Three years ago, four years ago, uh, when someone wanted to, to get uh, a LoRa One application up and running just for validating some idea, you had to invest on this gateway. And if you don't have the budget, what are you going to do? But right now we have an open source cloud network, an, op sorry, an open cloud source network that is right there that you can just enter to explore that helium.com evaluate is nearby you, there is some hotspot deployed, and um, if they are, you can just take your LoRaWAN nodes, register on the Helium console, and you are ready to go, and ready to start validating your ideas under this open network. So it's pretty cool, because now you don't need to truly invest on this hotspot, because I are another kind of community, which is a crypto and blockchain community, investing on deploying this hotspot for you, but they are help us. They are helping us to create a connected world for the IoT developers and IoT entrepreneurs who are building solutions on top of this network. So this is some, just an intro about Helium for all of those for all of those who don't know about this technology. I highly encourage you to check it out. It is a, a, a pretty interesting technology, and I really think that we as an IoT community we we can take a lot of advantage of of it. So. Jump into the workshop once again. Uh, we have, uh, we need to also have, we're going to integrate all of these to Ubidots, um, to Ubidots IoT platform. And basically the step-by-step -step that we're going to be following right right here is the following one. So let's jump Go to the Ubidots. By the way, um, for anyone listening, Ubidots has offered a discount on their um, IoT platform for all conference attendees. So you can do this workshop as well as get a Ubidots license. Um, amazing. Uh, for a Christmas treat for yourself. All right, back to you. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Maybe we can do some giveaway after the call, after the mm -hmm. conference about uh, some Wizblog developer kits for sure. Um, so someone who wants to get started with it can quickly do it by having these kits in their hands. So yeah, before getting that to the final solution, uh, we need to understand the basic workflow of how is how it works uh, uh, Laura wants to make the IoT application. First, we have LoRaWAN devices that must be transmitting data over a gateway to a LoRaWAN network server. This can be the thing is that Helium or either other ones such as SherpaStack, Laureate, and many others that are available on the ecosystem. Uh, since after our devices are transmitting data to this, to this, um, through this gateway, sorry, uh, we need to we are going to see this data on a LoRaWAN on the LoRaWAN network server, and we need to set up a decoder to translate the incoming data that is being sent by our sensors. 
since these sensors are being sent in data uh, over the LoRa protocol communication, this protocol communication is a protocol that allows us to, let's say, save, um, save uh, the amount of data that we are sending in order to reduce the bat and in order to get a um, beneficial battery lifetime on our product line. So the data is being sent in bytes, so we need to get the data that is being sent from our devices, decode it to a readable format, and then pass it to a JSON format that is going to be able to be sent to third-party services such as Jupyter. So after we handle like this decoder part, we need to set up an integration, which is pretty simple to 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 you to to do it since the widow team have have been putting a lot of effort and did a really great job either with the thing stack and helium in order to provide look up like click click and point integrations where you just need to go click place your UBDOT token and you are ready to go and your devices are immediately sending data to your UBDOT account in just a few seconds so it's pretty amazing so as I just shared this is not a hand on session. However, this is the step that you need to follow in, in terms of getting and setting up a device either on the Helium console or on the thing stack. For the Helium console, you need to add a new device, then add a function decoder using the custom decoder format. Then you need to set up an integration and choose UBDOTS, then place your UBDOTS token from your UBDOTS account, and you are ready to go. Your devices are can start sending data, but to integrate all of these, you need to set up a flow inside the UBDOTS console in order to interconnect either the device, the decoder, and the integration modules. In the thing stack uh, side, it's almost the same process. We have, uh, we need to create a new application, then we add a new device on it. We also need to set up a decoder. In this case, it's not called decoder payload. In this, call, in this case, it's called uplink payload for mother. And the option that you need to choose over here is JavaScript instead of, instead of custom. But the decoder is completely the same for both platforms. And then you need to integrate it with UBDOS by clicking on the integration portion and then just choosing UBDOS and placing your UBDOS token on top of it. So now it's time to start sending data. But before, uh, before to, to jump in on that section, I would like to highlight the decoder function. Uh, this is how we are going to translate the Wislock environmental data to a human readable format. First, we have the encoded data that is coming from the end devices, pass it into a decoder function, and ultimately we get the JSON key value object, as you can see on the right side. So, so basically what we have here is a JavaScript decoder uh, for the Wislock environmental device data frames. Looks like that, the, this one that I, you can see over here. So as you can notice on the decoded JSON, the dictionary, the, 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 the JSON dictionary, all the variables that are uh, right there uh, are alongside the decoded data that is being sent directly by the devices. So uh, now it's time to set up the hardware as well as the software side. For the hardware, it's pretty simple to set up. It's just like getting your, your core clicking as it was a Lego. It's pretty simple. Then you can secure it with a super tiny screen, a screw, sorry, and then you can connect the environmental sensor uh, that I highlight on the whisper requirements. Then after you set up all of these, you need to set up the, the software environments. This can be either on Arduino IDE or in platform IO. Pretty easily, you can refer to the docs.directwallets.com where you can find all the steps that you need to follow to handle this in just a couple of minutes. So after you set up, for example, here, uh, is example for the Arduino IDE. However, you can find also them in the platform I.O. Uh, if after you set up the board, you are going to find a uh, example uh, list of different of, of different examples. <laughs> uh, and what's, what one of the really cool thing is that the example not just provide the examples of how to get started with a specific sensor. No, it also provide a solution folder where you can quickly build, pre-build an uh, entire solution just by that example. So you just need to replace the relevant, uh, let's say, LoRaWAN keys that you need in order to be able to match uh, the, the parameters of the region you are based, as well as assign the keys that are being generated once you create this device on the LoRaWAN network service that you are using. So basically, 
this is like what you have to take into consideration. If you choose, for example, the Wislock environmental example, uh, you need to refer to this portion of the code uh, where you need to highlight uh, based on the, the payload um, data side, the, based on the payload size as well on the region, you need to define the data rate that you, you are going to be using based on the data, uh, based on the payload of the environmental um, example, I need to use a data rate one since it's, the, since it's exceeding the payload size. And also since it, that is also taking into consideration the region where I'm based, which is the AU1915. And also then you need to set up the region where you're going to be deploying this sensor, the sensor in order to match the gateways configuration as well as the spectrum where, of the area where you are deploying these LoRaWAN solutions. So after this, you need to place the keys that were generated on the LoRaWAN network servers in order to match and be able to join the LoRaWAN network with the different devices that you are configuring. And after you do this and you upload the board, the code into your board and handle the previous uh, steps that I just shared with you, you are going to immediately see these devices up and running on your UBIOTS account. Here you can see uh, how a new device on Blue was created. And then when I join to that device, you can identify the different variables uh, that I'm sending from my end device and also from additional variables from the LoRaWAN uh, network that it was connected to it. So one of the coolest things that I love about um, like the most about Huidots is that Huidots helps you to, to build like fully customizable IoT solutions. So imagine that you have this Wisplug which is a, model, a fully modular platform that allows you to interconnect different kind of technologies to quickly validate an idea, and then you have UV right there. Uh, everybody, I'd like to welcome anybody who would like to experience. do the final presentation uh, from a speaker at this event. Uh, Herman from Sensor.Tech will be presenting on <laughs> the summit stage. So please uh, come Sorry. on up to the summit stage, <laughs> and thank you very much. Okay, here we are. So basically, here we, you have these, and then you have the experience of having a fully customized experience with UbiDot. So if you're trying to validate an idea or handle a proof of concept to present it to an investor or to get some funding, you can entirely get all these tools that are available right there for you and build something solid that is industrial grade and is going to definitely help you to get that funding that you are looking for. So. Then after you receive the data, you can go to the dashboard section on your UBIDOTS account and uh, start creating the dashboard of your dreams by playing around with the different widgets that you have available. And then you can fully customize as well your entire, like the brand of your platform. Uh, and you can, you're going to be able to have something like is shared on the, on the screen. So just to show you more like the modularity of the Wislog ecosystem, here we have another solution, which is a weather monitoring using not the Bosch sensor, but using some more basic separate emitted sensors Then another aside, which is a pressure sensor as well as a light sensor. And this is how it will look like the integration with Uyots as well. And on the downside, we have another one, which is a GPS tracker that has a GPS models and a accelerometer model. And this is how you can have the traceability of the asset that you are tracking in the environment. So. Basically, this is how this looks like. Uh, and if you want to, to get more, like getting more, uh, getting, getting more information about the Wisdom ecosystem, I highly encourage you to check out these resources where you can find all you need about the ecosystem and how to quickly get started with it. And also something that I would like to uh, even highlight over here is that once again, this is an open source product. So you can build your own models if there is something that is not existing right there. For that, you can explore the awesome Wislog repository where our contributors of our community share their designs right there. And also not just design for hardware, but also design for enclosure. For example, let's say you have a 3D printer in your house and you want to 3D print some enclosure to just validate the idea. You can quickly go through that the, through the GitHub, download the, the STL file, print it, and you are ready to, to mount it. Just to give you an example uh, here, I'm going to share my, my screen uh, to like to my workbench. For example, here we have um, a baseboard 
we has a light sensor as well as a, a buzzer model. Uh, and this is sending data to UbiDots, not using the LoRaWAN coverage, but using uh, Wi-Fi connectivity. This is, this is an ESP32 port. So right now, I'm going to join to the, my UbiDots dashboard. Uh, I have a, a button right there, uh, but I think I cannot share that to you <laughs> because I didn't uh, set up that screen. Sorry, I tried to do my best in this uh, stream thing, but I'm going to click the button. And here you can see how remotely the booster is being controlled over MQTT using the platform and the response is super quickly. It is immediately. Uh, and also, um, and also one other thing is that here, over here, this is one option. And this is the one that we just presented. This is the LP1 core model uh, that has the Bosch sensor here. It is pretty tiny, or super tiny sensor if you compare it with my fingers and the size of the board, it's pretty tiny. And we just released one, which is the half size of this, which is a perfect solution for those who are looking to address any, let's say, a asset tracking application and are looking to get a more tiny device. And this is an enclosure that I just printed. It's pretty cool. I didn't have like this battery, so I just paste this lip over here, both like over here, but I can just put it in the top, uh, close it, place the, place the specific screw on top of them. Just let me do it quickly so you can see the final result over here. And here I just like place this, then the other one, and I missed the third one, so we can just connect them all. Just let's secure everything. I love this electronic and this is, driver. This is how you know Maria is for real or not. She's not making all this stuff. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, and this is this is how you have it. Like this is how you have it. Like the, here you have a, an environmental sensor, uh, which is uh, like a industrial grade sensor, and it is uh, in a three D printed enclosure. But you can also get like these enclosures, like the the. Um, the plastic and the robust version on the Rack Wallace store, or you can build it by your own if you want, build something customized. But this is something that is already, we just build in a couple of seconds and can be easily integrated with UbiDos, and you can showcase a final product. Or for example, either as well this one, this is a, a like a, yeah, a, a outdoor enclosure that has a whisk look inside, it's also a GPS tracking a device. Uh, and here you you can just place this metallic plate in the top of the of the whistle. Lock. Then you can place the battery, connect it, connect your open your solar panel to it. And here you have a fully autonomous solutions that can be deployed either on a car or either in the agriculture sector. So you can deploy this device and forget it completely about it. So it's pretty cool. The ecosystem it's pretty big. Uh, I think it's it's a time to just like explode it. Uh, start thinking with it and evaluate the different and the big things that you can uh, start building with with all of this. So I think like yeah, uh, let me just finish over here so we can close. So that's all for the session I have prepared for you. Uh, I don't know if someone have any additional question. It is a pleasure to to share this with you and if someone have something to add or or yeah or ask happy to address any question you may have thanks awesome thanks so much maria yeah um you know you guys you can give a toby dance instead of uh, applause, it's toby applause. <laughs> but it looks, yeah, it looks like you have some dancers there in the audience <laughs> Um, Amazing, I love it. Yeah, what a rock star final workshop for our, our workshop uh, plateau today. So thank you, Maria. And what a clever way of getting around the limitation where you can't screen share and do your video at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I I'm using a, a software that is called MMHMM. <laughs> M <laughs> that is a software for, uh, for Apple users. It's pretty cool, it's super easy to set up and interface with. We handle a weekly hand on session with our Rapster community on Fridays. So, in some way, I have been thinking with this 
mm-hmm. uh, software tool for streaming a lot. <laughs> So I have two I have two quick simple questions and then um, yeah then we'll open it up to the floor. So first, um, I'm super excited about these Wii blocks. Like this is awesome. I love the idea. I love how easily they implement. Um, how many different types of blocks are there right now? Right now we have more than fifty available, and okay. we're uh, we're launching. We are about to announce another launch uh, by the end of the year, and we're aiming to have more than ninety. Uh, for the entire ecosystem and this ecosystem is going to keep growing but as i just mentioned like there is no limitation if there's something that is, doesn't exist right there if you have the 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 resources and the ability to design hardware you have the tools and the templates to build your own models for your solutions because the information the documentation is available right there because it is an open source project Awesome. And also, if you yeah. need some help, you can reach out to us on our on our Discord on our Discord channel, and we can help you to go into that process and help you in any doubt that you have during that creation time. Okay, sweet. And yeah, and that relates to my second question, which is that workshop that we really jammed through quickly. Is is that available somewhere online if someone wanted to get some with blocks yeah, and, and then for do sure. the workshop? For sure, for sure. Actually, you can reach out to Doug's rat, uh, Doug's rat, uh, Doug's rat, uh, Doug, Doug's dot ragwallace dot com, uh, mm. and you can go to the Wislock section, and there you are going to find a getting started with for all the for all the models that are available, and either for the solutions that I just prepared, I just shared to you, either using the thing stack or using Helium. Thank you. All right. No, if anyone else has, has any questions, um, just trot on up to the stage near Maria, and, and you can ask it directly. And Maria, you might have to repeat their questions so that everyone can hear. <laughs> Perfect. Hello. Hey there. Hello. Thanks for this cool presentation. I have a question. Um, what kind Go ahead. Of, what kind of industries are you like tackling this year with, with blocks? Well, for being honest, we're targeting like any industry right now. Uh, we have been getting use cases for manufacturing plants. Uh, they are using a lot the industrial models since we have uh, 40 to 20 million pairs and zero to five volts uh, models, and they are like like really common on the industrial environment. So our clients are using it to get got the information for vibration sensors or for flow gases uh, sensors, like industrial grade ones. Also, we have uh, some clients in Argentina uh, using it to uh, monitor different uh, agriculture uh, application as well, uh, and as well asset tracking. It's it's getting pretty interested in asset tracking. Uh, actually, there's a project that it's pretty cool that is called the Whistle Mapper, and actually we have over down here the creator of the of the tutorial that we have been prepared, which is Johan Macias. Basically, it's a project oh, that we create. <laughs> it is a project that, that we create in order to help all of those who want to start thinking with the helium technology to deploy IoT solutions to start validating the coverage that is being generated by these hotspots that are being deployed by people that are not in the IoT community. So, with this device that I have over here, this is the mapper, or this can be also a mapper because both of them have GPS. I can just like set up a, a code into this, and then I can connect it to this device over my phone, over BLE, and send the 80 commands to set up to a specific network. And then I can start validating the coverage around my city of the helium. So it's pretty cool because you can identify like all the network that you have available to the their solutions. Like, we were like with the, with another IoT community that I lead here on Medellin, um, which is called IoT Medellin. We start the initiative of let's start mapping the helium coverage in Medellin, and in just one day, it was incredible to see how much coverage we could get with just twenty deployments around the city. Christina, you are from Medellin, so you know the area. So imagine that we we had a, a hotspot deployer. Uh, like nearby, I don't know, the Parque Poblado, and we cut a dot in the first mirador of, of Las Palmas. <laughs> Imagine that. 
like more than uh, more than eight miles of connectivity. So it is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly, because we're the Belgian is, is in between a valley, so it's it is incredible. Cool, cool, cool. That's so exciting. Oh my gosh, I love Brack. Thank you, Manny. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks to you. Actually, your talk was amazing. I love your presentation. <laughs> I love it. I love it. It was stunning. Cool. Well, we'll, um, we'll wrap up this presentation, but if there's any additional questions for Maria, uh, Maria, if you have any, any available minutes, um, you know, as for you sure. guys can maybe chat privately with Maria. Maria, if you were to just kind of move your topi to the right of the stage. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, she's a wealth of knowledge. So feel free to, um, you know, connect with her and say hi while we got her here. Thanks again for Perfect. being Thank involved so with this, Maria. No, thank you so much for this awesome space and we look forward to meet you with to meet with you all in person next year. Check it out.